For our COBT viewers, it's Maynard, Mike, and Todd here with something really cool. We're going to talk to David Holt today. David is the president of the Consumer Energy Alliance. Uh, he's also a partner at HBW. But David and I go way back. And one of the things that David does is he spends so much of his time and so much of his energy thinking about consumers and what they face, what they pay, what they want, how they're represented. Uh, David, I think it's a delight to have someone uh, speak up for such an important group, and we're super excited to have you. Glad to be here. Good to see you, Maynard. Well, we can't wait to jump in. Uh, Mike, what would you tell the rest of us about what's going on in the world? Yeah, well, today, um, equities, commodities, just assets in general are pretty much going sideways, maybe a little bit down today, but tomorrow is going to be huge, huge day for the markets. I mean, tomorrow you're going to be getting uh, the jolts, which is his job, uh, you know, a job opening report, and you'll also be getting the Fed's FOMC meeting tomorrow, rate decisions tomorrow. I think most people expect that the Fed is not going to raise rates uh, tomorrow, and no one expects them to cut rates either. And, and I think the expectations, given where yields at, you know, uh, with the 10-year that most people expect the Fed may not even cut this year. If they do cut this year, it's going to be later in the year. And so I think it's tomorrow, there's going to be a lot of volatility in the markets. Everyone's going to be focusing on the FOMC uh, rate decision meeting. As far as crude oil, crude oil has kind of come off a little bit here over the last week, week and a half or so. And a lot of it is because of you know talks of a ceasefire, talk about a hostage exchange. So some of that uh, has been sort of put on the sidelines and, and then markets have pulled back. I wouldn't worry too much about that. I look at the uh, oil supply and demand looks pretty constructive in the second half of the year. So not worried about it. There's going to be volatility around crude oil. I think from the stand, standpoint of broader equities, you know, I, most of the market is focused on the magnificent seven tech stocks. Most of those companies have reported. We have a few companies left this week. And so I think a lot of volatility after those companies report is going to go away from the market. And so something to think about. From an energy equity standpoint, uh, we count roughly 70 plus companies are reporting this week, really heavy on EMPs, midstream and utilities. And so you know, expect a lot of uh, volatility in those type names. And the last thing I'd say is, you know, as we talked to our, you know, our, our guest today, is like, the electricity theme is something we're going to talk about with our guests, but it's something the market is really focused on, not only with energy companies, but midstream companies are talking about it and industrial companies are talking about it and obviously electric utilities. So huge thematic thing. It was, it was big last quarter. It's even bigger this quarter. And so that's going to be really interesting to talk to our guests about what his thoughts are. Awesome. Todd, uh, anything you would throw in before we turn to David? Yeah, no, I was just kind of curious and, and preparing for the conversation. I, I just was sort of curious who's paying the most uh, for their electricity. And, and so I went to the EIA and, and checked, you know, right now, the most recent data is as of February. And I wanted to look at that. And I wanted to look at like last summer in July. And unsurprisingly, uh, the people paying the most are the states of California and then many of the states in the Northeast. Uh, and then the people paying the least are you know kind of what's classified as the i think west south central basically texas and oklahoma and louisiana and, and arkansas that region pays the least in february you had a couple mountain states uh north dakota and 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 utah actually were the very cheapest last summer you know you kind of think of power as really being a summer peak and it is but last summer the answer was pretty much the same uh california paid by far the most, and I was looking here at commercial customers because they're, you know, kind of the average or the median price you could say between residential and, and industrial. Northeast also paid a whole lot, and then the same region of the country paid less. I'm, I'm sure that we'll talk about some of those dynamics and hear about why, but you know, the answer is not very surprising. Uh, but but good for folks that live kind of in the Midwest and the South. Not so good for folks that live in the Northeast or on the coast. So anyhow, I'm sure we'll talk more about that soon. No, that's a, that's an awesome lead in. Um, David, it, it's I like what Todd, the way he put it, which is this is not surprising. It's kind of one of these things that everyone knows, but yet everyone doesn't know or everyone knows. And why aren't we talking about it more? Right. What What is uh, as a as a lead in? It is quite fun to talk to someone who's focused on the consumer perspective Tell, tell us a little bit about what's going on in consumer advocacy conversations, dialogues. I know it's different from state to state and you see the whole country, but give us a feel for, for your world um, standing up for consumers. 
Yep. Yeah. And, and a little bit of background on that, Maynard. Uh, Consumer Energy Alliance, we're going to be 20 years old in 2025, which is shocking to me as we all get older quickly. Um, but really, we're a consumer advocate. Uh, we are standing up for families, for small businesses, for manufacturers, for the airline industry, transportation, distribution, farmers, um, you know, the, the hospital, the restaurant, um, all those kind of, uh, you know, local community businesses all over the country. So we have about almost 400 member companies. Uh, the vast majority do not produce one molecule of energy. So it's all the different sectors of the U.S. economy. And then it's really kind of an all the above approach from the energy side. So it's oil, gas, nuclear, uh, wind, solar, hydro. Uh, so it's kind of that ecumenical, uh, all of the above approach to meeting our energy needs in an affordable, reliable, and environmentally responsible way. So when you look at it, as, you, as your lead in suggests here, when you look at it from that consumer advocate perspective, you know, policy dictates reliability, policy dictates affordability, and policy dictates our environmental trajectory, um, in addition to what the market and what uh, the, uh, the private sector is also doing. So policy can muck it up more than anything else, uh, and policy working in concert with the industrial sector and, and the private sector can really help advance some things. So uh, when you look at these states, uh, California, New York, the New England states, uh, and you compare those to the other states that that Todd mentioned uh, in the in the greater Midwest and some Mountain West states. Uh, you really look at the policies that they've put forth, and in many cases, they are very aggressive in a, in kind of an energy policy mandate. So they're requiring electrification. They're requiring uh, a movement in a certain direction, or they're restricting energy. Uh, a lot of uh, we've gone through the period where coal was restricted to the point where now coal is we're moving away from coal. But increasingly, we're seeing California, New York and other states restrict the use of natural gas, uh, limit the ability to add pipelines and infrastructure, um, just curtailing our ability to meet demand in those states. So it's really no surprise, as Todd mentioned, that that energy prices in those states are increasing. Uh, to the point where you're finding many businesses are looking, frankly, now to relocate from California or the New England states to one of these more energy affordable states. Uh, and we'll get into it more as we talk uh, further. But reliability is also something that's a little bit of a problem now, but it's about to be a very serious problem. Um, and you think that consumers are, are frustrated with high energy prices, gasoline, diesel, electricity. When we get into reliability and there is an increase in brownouts or blackouts in summer or in winter, um, we're going to have a, a, a very serious situation on our hands. And you're seeing all the grid managers around the country, particularly uh, in the New England states, in New York, in the kind of mid-Atlantic states, really jumping up and down now saying, hey, there's going to be a demand shortfall uh, or a, 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 a ability to meet demand shortfall by 2030, by 2032, by 2035. Um, and we're very scared. Those grid managers are very scared about what's going to happen in order to meet the basic fundamental energy needs of uh, families and businesses in those those regions of the country. So that's something I hope we spend some time on too. So D David, so one, one question, and you just take a step back, you have something so fundamental as <clears throat> your electric bill. You know, it's right there with your gas, gasoline cost, your rent, food. I mean, th this, is, this is one of the absolute basics. This is going up and it's going up more in certain places than others. Why, um, just kind of wondering, you know, where's the, and I, I'm not trying to be, um, you know, too much, I want to use too much hyperbole here, but where is the congressional hearing? Where, where is the, uh, where is the outrage? Where is the, um, the, the, the politician standing up and saying, uh, we, we can't do this. This is, it just seems like relative to the problem, there's very little discussion of what's happening to businesses and families as a result of this. I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, it's, it's like so many other things in, in 
the United States in the political world today. It's a bunch of finger pointing, a bunch of noise, uh, posturing, uh, overly politicizing things. Um, everything becomes this partisan, you know, fight, the zero sum game. And when you look at energy policy, if there's one thing in, in our country that should be nonpartisan, it should be energy policy because it affects every man, woman and child so fundamentally. And people on fixed incomes and, and people that can't afford to pay more for energy are the ones that are the most impacted. So when you look at it from that perspective, you're correct. Everyone should be standing up and kind of saying, OK, what can we do about this? <clears throat> A lot of the conversation politically has really been focused on the environmental aspects of energy and, and energy policy for the most part has been co-opted by some in the political world uh, by the environmental side of things. So energy policy becomes environmental policy. When you look at it from an environmental perspective, the United States is, is really doing well. Uh, we're one of the leaders, if not the leader in the world, in uh, emission reductions across the board, You know, whether it's carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sulfur uh, dioxides, nitrogen oxides, particulate matter, uh, all the things that go into you know city smog like VOCs and volatile organic compounds and things like that. I mean, really, the United States, the trajectory that we're on over the last 50, 40, 20, 10 years has been the world leader. Um, and there's more to do in that space. I don't, I'm not saying we're, uh, our mission's done. But we're really doing a very good job of meeting our environmental goals. Um, the forgotten part of the energy policy discussion <clears throat> is not only do we need to focus on the environment, but we can't lose sight of the fact that that energy must be affordable and energy must be reliable. And I think too much of the conversation in this polarized situation has has left those two aspects out. Uh, and affordable and reliable means wind, it means solar, it means natural gas, it means oil, it means carbon capture and sequestration, it means innovation. Uh, all those things kind of need to be bundled up together. Um, and then where does that where does that begin? Why aren't we seeing that conversation in the state houses in Washington, D.C.? Uh, largely, I think it's a function of this finger pointing back and forth that the average voter isn't getting enough information to go back and say, hey, listen, uh, Congressman X, Congressman Y, I'm not going to vote for you. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican or an independent. I'm not going to vote for you if you don't have a sensible energy policy. Because when you look at the fact that our electricity prices nationally have gone up 30 percent in the last two years uh, because of energy and inflation, every household is spending almost $1,200 more a year than we were three years ago. Um, so all these things have a significant pocketbook issue. Um, and it's kind of going to be up to the voter to say enough already. Let's get back to the table. Let's look at something in a nonpartisan, bipartisan way uh, so that we can make a difference. Because, you know, if there's a function of something that impacts all of us, it's energy, energy policy, because Let's take diesel prices, for example. When diesel prices go up, the price of everything that's delivered on diesel truck goes up. So eggs, milk, bread, lumber, clothing, all the things that we're struggling with when we go to the grocery store every other week and we see our eggs are, have, have gone up another 15 cents, a dozen, um, that's a, largely the result of high diesel prices. So and high farming prices and on and on. So it all ripples down to that grocery store and we're paying more because of it. Um, and it's going to be up to us as voters to send a signal. We got a big election coming up in November. And again, it doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican or independent. All sides of the political equation need to come to the table on this. So do you think um, it's one thing you said it, it really jumps out. Mike's lead in was, you know, tomorrow everybody's going to be hanging on the FOMC meeting and, and how we're talking about inflation and, uh, you know, the rate cut uh, obsession that everybody has. You would think that if you're in Washington, D.C. and you're just trying to declare war on inflation, you would go right to such a major contributor like energy. Like if you're just sitting around the table saying, hey, we got to 
we got to attack, I'm not necessarily talking about the Fed, but we got to attack inflation, bring me the variables that are driving it. And the stats you just went through on energy and power prices, this is a key stat. So yeah. you, is, is anybody, is that an open, is inflation and, and trying to get inflation under control, is that an opening? Is that the door through which we're going to get better, um, you know, it's going to lead to better energy policy by talking about inflation first? Or what do you find resonates? Yeah, well, I think, uh, listen, I, I think inflation for this administration is a, <clears throat> is a hot button issue. And they're very concerned with it because as the economy goes, so goes elections in many cases. And, and we're seeing that the president is a little behind in the polls. Um, earlier in this administration, when gasoline prices, diesel prices went up very high, they released the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to help try to bring down prices, to show that they were leading, to show that they were doing something to help control gasoline and diesel prices in this country. Uh, it had a very short-term impact uh, because the SPR is, is so depleted. They have not really added any supplies back to the SPR since they depleted it. The, that's not really going to be as much of an option uh, this time around if we see higher gasoline prices as we head into the summer and fall. Um, so to answer your question, it is a huge driving force in our political discussion. It's going to be a huge part of this national and state and local elections at the federal level uh, between now and November. Um, what we do about inflation is going to be a debate. Um, and, you know, I'm going to argue and from a consumer advocacy perspective, argue that energy is the leading driver now with the Inflation Reduction Act and all the other money that they injected into the economy uh, with these bills that were passed in 2021, 2022, uh, that money's out there. There's not a lot we can do about it. But if you have sensible energy policies that allow for more energy options that do not create excessive mandates, that do not create energy restrictions, um, you're going to have a market that is able to determine where and how and how much energy is needed. And I think put downward pressure on energy. Let's take, for example, um, uh, the Gulf of Mexico. So the Gulf of Mexico, really, uh, the federal government has what's called a five-year planning process for leasing and development of our offshore waters. Really, now that really essentially means the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, all the other areas are essentially off limits for a variety of reasons. But this administration has played uh, kind of slow ball with the Gulf of Mexico energy development uh, since it came into office for a, a variety of reasons. Um, and now they're looking at there will be no lease sales in the Gulf of Mexico in 2024. That'll be the first time in the history of this statute that we haven't had a lease sale of any kind in a, in a, in a given year. For 2025, there might be one lease sale. If the administration and Congress got together and said, hey, we're going to move the ball a little faster and we're going to have two or three lease sales, even though we wouldn't find oil or natural gas and bring that oil and natural gas to market for, let's say, 10, 12 years, the signal to the markets that the United States is, hey, getting a little more serious about its energy policy, I would argue would help bring down a little bit energy prices in the near term. Uh, because I think for the most part, you look at energy markets and they look at some of these energy policies and they say, well, these energy policies are all designed to drive up prices. And that's where they're predicting the future is going to go. So, so uh, you, you mentioned signaling and thinking about some, some other signaling, particularly on the power side of things. Mm -hmm. If, if um, I guess we're just sort of fantasizing here for a minute, guys, but if the administration also said, or if Gavin Newsom said, or if, you know, a few of those New England governors in conjunction with everybody said, you know what, we need to build uh, 25 natural gas plants and five natural gas pipelines, and we just got to do it, and we got to fast track it, and we need to get it done. Or if there was sentiment like that around, it seems like in particular, natural gas, natural gas plants, natural gas pipelines, if you just, if there was just that breakthrough, boy, that would be. Wouldn't that be huge for 
power markets and the signaling and all of your consumers, I'm, I'm leading the witness a little bit here, but I'm just thinking, I'm dreaming a little bit here. Yeah, David. I love it. I, I mean, that's a great question. I think that it would be the single most impactful thing that could happen. Um, adding uh, infrastructure, streamlining our ability to permit uh, natural gas pipelines, transmission. You know, not only are we faced with uh, obstacles for for natural gas and nuclear, uh, transmission for wind and solar is increasingly having difficulty. But you know, wind and solar is great. Where it's going to be an added part of our energy mix, good energy diversity. But to your point, we have to have natural gas and or nuclear. Because that's what the market's called baseload power. From a consumer perspective, we call it permanent power. It's it's permanent power. It doesn't rely on the whims of the wind or the sun uh, to meet our energy needs. So when the wind is not cooperating, you have that permanent power that's always available, always on. And when you have those extreme weather days, very, very hot or very, very cold, you need that additional power that's always available to ramp up. Uh, to supply the needs of that increased demand. Right now, that's a gap. Um, and when you look at AI and you look at data centers and you look at Bitcoin and the amount of energy they need, uh, some of these data centers are now actually now looking behind the meter and how they can have private electricity uh, power generation, whether that's going to be a nuclear plant or a natural gas plant that's always available. But uh, we're going to have a hard time siting and building new data centers in various communities around the country or expanding AI or adding new Bitcoin because there's just not sufficient power to meet that increased demand. So that means jobs, that means economic opportunity, that means additional tax base for locals and states and federal government. Uh, all those things are gonna start being curtailed in some fashion in the very near future uh, without a serious conversation, exactly what you said, you know, wave that magic wand and say, hey, let's build X number of megawatts of new natural gas power generation or expand current natural gas power generation in order to meet basic needs. Um, in New England, New York, other places on the East Coast, California, certainly, uh, those conversations aren't occurring. And increasingly in Washington, we're kind of seeing ways to, to get around that with the new power rules from last week and things like that. When you get up in the morning, David, I'm struck by how, where do you focus, right? Because just look in our, our first 20 minutes here, we, we've, we've hit on some permitting issues, some, some signaling issues, uh, some just basic information and understanding. And then, you know, there's an, I would call it, there's an oil and gas sort of primary side mm -hmm. to all this. And then there's electricity and then it goes state by state. And some places are worse than others and there's pain. If, how do you say, okay, I'm grabbing this issue and I'm going to, you know, I got to focus on this particular piece of the puzzle. Like, how do you, how do you sort it all out and try to get someone's attention and try to make progress? Because there are a lot of issues here. The, 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 the fights never end. And, and that is increasingly a dilemma from our perspective. Um, a lot of it is, and if you get on the consumerenergyalliance.org website, you'll see we're, you know, fundamentally kind of a campaign organization, that consumer advocate. Um, so when our members in a certain region are facing a certain issue, kind of jump up and down a little bit for us, we tend to respond with a, either a mm -hmm. campaign or a, a deep dive into the state state house, if that's the case, or increasingly local communities, cities and counties that are grappling with permit issues, right-of-way issues, uh, with transmission now in Louisiana, Texas, and elsewhere, carbon capture and sequestration. So we run, we have about 12 different campaigns going on right now in 22 states around the country. Mm. Uh, and that runs from pipelines and infrastructure to transmission to wind and solar, uh, to carbon capture sequestration, to onshore and offshore oil and natural gas uh utilities power generation but everything is looked at from our perspective under the prism of okay are we meeting our environmental goals in an affordable and reliable way so from a consumer perspective you want to find the policies that advance reliable energy uh you want to advance affordable energy 
and you want to continue our environmental trajectory. And we argue you can do all three of those things at the same time. The problem with our political and policy debates right now is it's it's been so hyper focused only on one leg of those three legged of that three legged stool, the environmental aspect that we've lost sight of the fact that we have to have affordable and reliable energy. And we're getting to a situation now where that is going to be it's no longer a problem. It, we're heading toward a crisis. Um, so to answer your question, we are all over the place, Maynard. It's, um, it's, uh, I guess the ADD aspect of my, my brain is, uh, <laughs> you know, constantly chasing a new ball around. The, well, we're, around we're the, the same way. We got a, we got a different flavor every week. So, I mean, yeah. you know, ADD, we had something we identify with. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, I'm a creature of Washington. I, I, I worked for the first Bush administration in the late eighties, early nineties. Um, and so it's all looked at from a, you know, policy perspective, how can we first and foremost, move voters, move, um, uh, consumers in a way that they can influence local elected officials, uh, your congressional districts, state, and then ultimately, uh, Washington. And, um, it's an uphill battle. Uh, there's a lot of groups out there that are, uh, demagoguing this issue and, and not providing accurate, honest information around. So it scares consumers and it, it uh, evokes a reaction that's not necessarily helpful to the overall political debate. Yeah, David, I uh, just want to congratulate you for being at the Consumer Energy Alliance for the last going on 20 years now. I'm sure you've seen a lot over that time frame. You know, one of the things that kind of piqued my interest is what you said earlier in the conversation about over the last two years, electricity prices have gone up roughly 30 percent on average. And the reason that struck me is we really haven't seen the data center growth kick in yet. Yep. The reshoring, the electrification, every electric company, every electric utility, like we mentioned uh, this morning, is talking about multiple demand growth over the next six, seven, eight, nine years. And so I worry that you know prices have gone up substantially and you haven't even had demand really kick in yet. And so I worry about the policy perspective or, you know, bad decisions tend to be made when, when you're overreacting, you're reacting uh, to things that are, you know, you know like kind of coming at you really, really quickly. So maybe talk about how you're thinking about things. It feels to me like the data centers and a lot of these CNI customers, they're going behind meter, behind meter to get yep. their power. Uh, you're li even looking at energy companies are doing the same thing. And I worry that in the end that the consumer is going to get screwed here. Okay, maybe talk to us about how you're basically advocating for them. How how are they thinking about things? Do they realize what's coming at them over the next five or six years? They don't. They don't. And actually, uh, we're in kind of early conversations about having a, a kind of expanded outreach, maybe a campaign related exactly to that. Um, no one is grappling no one's talking about policy decisions made today are going to increase prices tomorrow and make energy less reliable tomorrow um and you know from from my perspective you can see it the horizon's getting very close when you talk to folks at pjm or iso new york or iso new england who are sending reports to uh state regulators and and the legislator in all those states saying, guys, we have a serious problem. Here's, look at this. Um, and those are largely being ignored in some cases by a political leader who will say, well, you know, that's five years away. I won't be in office today. Well, that's just unconscionable to make that kind of kick the can decision. Um, so the more we and other consumer groups out there can look at this and say, this policy, or this protest, this group that said no to this pipeline and prevented that pipeline through lawsuit, through uh, pipeline blockades, whatever, that prevented that pipeline, that infrastructure project from, from going forward, um, the protests and the policies made today are going to increase your electricity prices. They're going to increase your gasoline and diesel prices. And they're going to make it more and more likely that you're going to have brownouts or blackouts. So I think I don't want to see this, but it, it almost feels inevitable that we're going to have 
summertime and wintertime announcements for planned blackouts or, or brownouts or a really high likelihood that that's going to occur and, and urging people to cur- curtail their electricity use. If you're an EV, uner- EV owner, don't charge your car. So some real material changes to our everyday behavior are, are of just months, if not just a few years away. So getting ahead of that so that we can say, this policy is going to result in X, predict it, have that prediction come through, kind of look back at it and say, you know, this was predictable, it was predicted, and then have that happen a few times to ed- help educate voters. Um, that is first and foremost. Uh, what we saw in California with PG&E, where there were some policy decisions that were made to not clear cut trees around uh, transmission lines, that some other things that kind of prevented PG&E from doing some basic maintenance. Then we had the forest fires, we had the blackouts, we had all the things we know occurred uh, just a few years ago in California. Well, the the regulators and the legislature and the governor blame PG&E. PG&E accepted the responsibility for a lot of it, but a lot of it was foreseeable because of some policy decisions that were made that could have been more informed, let's say. So that's occurring now in other states. Um, We are active in Connecticut, Delaware, Maryland, other eastern seaboard states to say, let's not follow the lead of New York and New Jersey and California, and here's why. Polling and focus grouping a lot of these states suggest that they don't want to be California. They don't want to follow California's lead. Um, so that's a little bit of good news that that the nation is seeing the mistakes that were made in California and you're seeing the business flight from the state uh, to other states like Texas and elsewhere. So um, we have more evidence to show consumers and families of uh, the impact these draconian policies can have on their future. So um, unfortunately, we might need a little bit more of that. But that's kind of where my head is right now on trying to to educate voters. Election cycles are a big opportunity to do that. So we're we're looking at some things where we're going to start ramping up here fairly soon in time for this November election and then midterms and then probably the next election cycle as well. Hey, David, this is all super interesting stuff. One thing that occurred to me this morning, I was looking at some of that EIA data, but then I started thinking and I wanted to ask you, where should people look to see some of this information? Where, where is, where, and where are the right sources to say, well, what is a holistic energy cost for me or my business or this company I've invested in, you know, just because we've got the EIA sitting out there, we've got states that track all this stuff, but they're can be discrepancies and measurements between those things. And then I guess a second part of the question would be, you know, a lot of the policy seems to be making a trade-off between cost and environmental impact. Yep. Is there a way to see something that says, all right, I've, I've chosen to live in a state that pays more money for our electricity, but the carbon footprint per electron or however you want to measure it is in fact smaller. So I guess I'm kind of curious about where do you look to find good sources of information? And then does anybody put together a holistic picture of both the positives and the negatives of what some of the policy choices have been? Maybe that's what you guys do. Uh, well, but, Todd, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the second half of my question, your question first, and I'm going to hire you as one of our marketing directors immediately because <laughs> you just teed me up. Um, CEA is finalizing a state cor- scorecard that looks at exactly that, uh, how states are balancing environmental responsibility, affordability, and reliability. And it's going to come out with an A, B, C, or D, or F score. Uh, and we're, uh, a couple of the states are kind of done, uh, but we're going to start rolling those out. So check out consumerenergyalliance.org. I'll follow up with you guys and send you emails when they when they come out so you can send it out to, to all the listeners as well. But um, so that's one. And we're pretty excited about that. It's, um, you know, some of the states we've discussed, which are uh, examples of kind of the poor policy, they're scoring about like you would think they would score. So um, it's uh, it's going to track a little bit with the logic that we've discussed here. But 
uh, there are a few surprises um, in store as well. So we're putting the final touches on that, and that should be coming out here pretty soon. Um, for your first question, you know, traditionally, you know, for the for the wonks among us that really follow this closely, IEA, the International Energy uh, Agency, and EIA at the Department of Energy have been really good places to kind of follow um, energy model predictions, demand predictions, supply predictions. IEA, you know, in the last uh, several months, really um, has, I think, started to air on an, an imbalanced perspective. So we might be even be losing one of our supposedly unbiased sources a little bit from uh, pressure from, um, I guess, someone what you would call the environmental left of the perspective. Um, and, and, you know, we would love to see that stay balanced and really balance all the, the competing needs. So that's one that I think we're kind of losing. Uh, EIA at Department of uh, Energy is a, is another one that just gives you good data uh, that you have to mine. But beyond that, who's looking at this? You get some good analysis from Moody's occasionally and some of the other you know investment houses that are looking at this from a longer term perspective. Um, obviously, groups like Consumer Alliance are looking at it from a consumer perspective, but in terms of finding that really good source that you're asking about, um, we we need we need some help there. So along those lines, David, um, of what Todd just asked, I guess the the other thing you I'm curious about some of your campaigns and and some of the things that have happened because you at some level you've you've got to um, you're reaching out to the consumers you're trying to help them understand they know their power is up right but then you're trying to show them let me let me tell you how to take action or let me let me show you the connection between the decisions and your power bill and then, and then as you say there's a lot of noise in the system and so is is one of your biggest challenges um is it amplifying the voice, the 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 voices of consumers, or is it really educating them first so that they then do start speaking up? Like, what what is the bigger issue for you as you um, as you try to work with consumers to get them to push for change? Is it just organizing them, or is it first you have to help them understand what's happened here? That, that's such a good question, Maynard. It, it's really at this point, it's it's trying to lead the fight, I guess, a little bit, you know, let's plant that flag out there for, for voters to rally around, um, mobilizing voters. We've seen, I mean, we're, we're all watching these, uh, you know, protests at Columbia university and university of Texas and elsewhere. And there's, there's a agree with it, disagree with it. There's a passion that's there that mobilize these students and other activists to show up. You see a lot of the passion there from the the climate change side of the equation that, that these these uh, voters uh, will show up uh, and protest and march on Washington to to for for climate change and and what have you. Uh, the average business person that's paying that bill that's uh, frustrated is not as maybe passionate about it that they'll go and and, and you know march. We're not to that point yet. I do think when energy electricity becomes less reliable, uh, you're going to see a big tipping point. But we don't want that to happen, right? We want to prevent that situation in 21st century America. We should never have a brownout or blackout. That's just unconscionable to me. It is. Um, so first, it's, first it's trying to lead, and then while you're leading, how does that army come with you? How do you mobilize that army? What aspects of the Army can you mobilize fast? We have a lot of union members in the Pennsylvania, Ohio Valley area. Union mm -hmm. members are great. They show up, they mobilize, they're fantastic. Uh, but the business community, that average homeowner that's got a couple of kids that are going back and forth to be between soccer games and, and just trying to raise a family, it's, um, it's a different equation to mobilize them with fear or anger or emotion whatever is going to be that driving factor. Um, and 
being honest, being as unbiased as you can, being truthful with our facts. That's something that we're going to continue to strive to do and, and sure we do. Sometimes uh, these other groups that are activists on the other side that are anti-energy activists uh, play a little fast and loose with the facts. Okay, so can I ask you to speculate here? Because I'm just curious. But let, let's say we had the five governors right now with us whose states have the highest power prices. Yep. And we said, okay, love you guys. You know, welcome to the show. Um, do, you, do you realize, um, do, do you yourself, are you connecting your policy choices with your power outcomes? And do you yourself understand if power prices are this much that it will do this to the industrial slash business slash uh, working people of your state. So do you think they understand this, but just think, well, you know, politically, I, it's just, it's just not something I'm going to fix. Or do you think at some level, they just really don't understand it? Uh, and I know that's a really hard question because we're specul we're just totally speculating, but I guess it could be a broad question for political leadership. Do people understand it, but don't want to address it? Or are they themselves confused? You know, it's, um, I, you know, I, I fundamentally believe in in humanity and I think people are, are basically pretty smart. So I think, you know, on average, uh, most political leaders at a certain level understand basic economics. Uh, they understand supply and demand um, and they are instead of looking at it from a supply and demand standpoint, um, trying to, I guess, pander, for lack of a better word, to a political base that's going to mobilize, that's going to turn out. And that political base, they believe, is, is more, they have a better ability to mobilize them if they talk about climate change. Um, and they gloss over the fact that from a emission reduction climate change perspective, the United States is leading the world. Um, and they expect, I guess, businesses that will just kind of take the higher prices and, and not relocate. Uh, it, it is a little bit of a change, sea change here in the last you know, year or so where you're seeing increasingly businesses making these big decisions to relocate big factories, big manufacturing facilities to other states that have more affordable energy. Um, so that is a good message for these governors that are more draconian in their energy policy. Um, but they also need to hear from their voters. Like I said, the more their voters you know, understand that their frustration with paying four, 450 a gallon for gasoline, paying 30, 40, 50% sometimes in the New England states for electricity is a direct result of these policies. And they send a signal to these elected officials. I mean, elected officials, their self-interest is first and foremost in getting reelected. So the most powerful thing we as a society can do is say, I'm not gonna vote for you because you keep raising my energy prices. Um, and so when you ask about leading and, and pulling the army with us, the best thing we can do is say, Hey, listen, this policy is raising your energy prices. It's up to mm -hmm. you to do something about it. One, one problem, you know, that comes up, this is a, a, another issue, but when, when you talk about the U.S. debt, for instance, yep. one reason why people don't seem to get too bothered about it is they say, well, the U.S. is still better than, you know, all these other places. It's better than China and Japan and Europe and so on and so forth. I wonder if that happens in our energy slash power discussions, because even though the U.S. is doing these things and even though the U.S. has costs going the wrong direction, it's still light years better than Europe. And it is, um, you know, we're an energy uh, a superpower in terms of our mm -hmm. own production. So is, is one of the reasons why it's hard to get people's attention on this is even though things have gotten worse, we're still better off than so many other people. Is that, is that part of the issue, do you think? In, it, yes, and it's cyclical. Uh, 
generally, I think the last three years, we've had pretty consistent higher prices for a variety of reasons, but um, it really takes that magic $4 a gallon on average price uh, from a gasoline perspective for people to really start paying attention to it. Electricity prices, people are watching their prices go up. Um, there is, a, I think, a better linkage between energy prices and inflation now uh, with the average consumer. So all those things roll up in it. Um, a little bit contradictory, but to your point, you know, um, when you look at global oil prices and you look at the conflict in Ukraine, conflict in the Middle East, just, um, you know, global turmoil, because the United States is producing so much oil and natural gas now, it really acts as a, as a hedge against uh, global oil prices because we're still the number one, you know, user of oil and natural gas in the world because of our economy. So, Oil prices could be swinging wildly like they did in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But because the United States is producing so much more now, it acts as a kind of a, a, a moderating force, which is actually very good news. Um, the problem with that is if you look at the trajectory of a pol from a policy perspective, you start seeing where the United States is going to start ticking down from a oil production, natural gas production in the very, very near future. Uh, so that's problematic. But um, because of our ability to prove so much, you know, prices are a little bit better than they otherwise could be um, in the near term, which is, I think, you know, somewhat good news in the grand scheme of things. You know, we always ask, what does the energy world look like in the next 10 years or so? And I guess my question for you is, what does your organization look like in the next 10 years? And what do you think you'll be talking about in the next 10 years? And, and maybe in, in, in that, uh, do you think in the next 10 years, I, I look at three constituents, I look at the politicians, regulators, and consumers. Where's the gap? Where's the cohesion there, do you think, in the next 10 years? Uh, another great question. And I think <clears throat> from a power perspective, you know, that, that, that sector is going to change a lot in the next 10 years. It's changed a lot in the previous 10, but it's it's going to be uh, really fascinating to watch uh, the, the, the whims of policy and uh, where the market takes the, the power sector. Um, from a CEA perspective, you know, I, I, I think we'll be a bigger organization. Um, I would love to see other consumer advocates that kind of take a pro-business, pro-consumer from an affordable, reliable perspective on various aspects of the economy. There aren't really many consumer advocates out there that are like Consumer Energy Alliance. You know, most of the consumer advocates you traditionally see have been Sierra Clubs and, and groups like that. But I would love to see more arguments that help balance the debate, more entities that help ba balance the debate. Um, and I would love, I, I do predict that CEA will continue to be more and more local. So more operations in counties and cities around the country to help really from a, a, a bottom up perspective, um, you know, make these arguments, help voters make these connections, help businesses meet their power needs and, and energy needs, and then give them a louder voice. Um, not only through CEA, but their own. How do we prop prop up these stories? There's a lot of a lot of really emotional, powerful anecdotes out there that uh, showcase what energy and bad energy policy does to people. So I think in the next ten years you'll see that. Um, and also, I would argue that it's going to. It took us a while to get in this situation where policymakers are making okay. these bad decisions. It's going to take us a little while to dig ourselves out of it. So it's probably a 10 year uh, multi-election cycle effort to, to get this thing back to balance. Hey, David, last one from me, and this has been super interesting discussion. When you guys are, are I don't know if advocating or proposing would be the right word, but as you're thinking about, you know, sort of the right kinds of solutions, you know, how do you balance, I'll call it cost. I mean, we got all three cost and reliability and environmental impact, but particularly cost and reliability, you know, how do you guys think about the right balance there? And I'm just thinking if, you know, if I'm an independent power producer and I want to build a natural gas plant, you know, it, it would be nice, you know, to have some kind of capacity payment or some sort of other sort of baseload mechanism. But if I'm just a consumer, I'm like, well, I don't really want to pay that. I just want to pay for the energy, you know, but what's the, 
how do you guys try to navigate maybe some of your constituents with a you know, there's a little bit of misalignment of interest, I think, sometimes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then especially when we go to what what are the best, most effective solutions? Again, you have this, there's sometimes a market design mismatch. There's sometimes, you know, the people that can provide the solutions aren't always in the same bucket as the people paying for the solutions. And in fact, they very rarely are. So how do you how do you guys balance, you know, those those factors? You guys are good. This is not your first podcast, man. These are great <laughs> questions. Um you know, we we tend to, for a variety of reasons, kind of stay out of individual rate cases when there's a a utility that's going to expand a power plant or something, and they're trying to pass on the rate, and the regulators kind of coming in, and you know, the, you know the drill. Um, it just gets a little too specific and single entity for us. We like to stay a little higher than that and talk about you know near term and long term affordability. Um, you know. Power plant expansions, a classic one. When you get into nuclear, you know, and Vogel just uh, came on on online, and and when Vogel was going through its various rate cases in Florida and Georgia and elsewhere, you know, there was a lot of debate about it, uh, and there's still debate about it. There's still some rate cases that are associated with it that you know consumers in the near term are saying, "Wow, you want me to pay this much more uh, to help you know fund the construction of this nuclear facility?" But you know, if you educate voters and you talk about, hey, there are near term affordable issues, but then you have longer term affordability issues where over the, the life of this nuclear facility, you're not going to see your rates go up. Whereas other power generation um, resources are going to have, you know, price swings and different prices in 10 years, 15 years. So it's it's that becomes a really nuanced ar- argument. Um, it's one that, you know, frankly, consumer and alliance is, is, is better at the more macro, um, even at the state level, macro level, uh, to talk about energy diversity, more energy options, uh, do not restrict energy, any energy resources. But all that said, we have got to start getting serious in this country about nuclear, uh, especially if your goals are environmental performance. You can't get there without more nuclear. So it's um, that's something that that we're going to have to CEA and the nation are going to have to grapple with as an example of uh, something that does have that near term price increase that really hits that affordability factor like you've discussed, but in the long term uh, provides a tremendous benefit for for businesses and families. David, I was just thinking uh, when the IRA uh, was passed and 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 rolled out was. Did did CEA have a particular view a, about that, or try to lean into certain aspects of that? I, I think I just thought of it because you know, one you could argue we could have just funded directly more nuclear build, or we could have done some other yeah. things. A lot of stuff in the IRA, but did you have a particular reaction to the IRA? Overall, no. There there were some uh, you know research and uh, technology applications uh, in the IRA, which were really, you know, kind of minor in the grand scheme of things, but that were helpful. Um, we, we were supportive of some of the carbon capture language in the IRA. And obviously we're seeing the carbon capture business uh, starting to blossom, uh, which is ultimately directionally very helpful, uh, not only for individual companies, Nucor Steel, for example, is a board member of CEA, um, you know, these large industrial corporations that have sustain their sustainability plans include carbon capture. So it gives them a good avenue um, so we can continue our environmental trajectory in also an affordable, reliable way. So there were little bits of the IRA that we were supportive of, but overall, we kind of stayed neutral on and, and quiet on, on the vast majority of it. So you've been so generous with your time, David, and there's just many things we could keep talking about. Um, I guess as we wrap up, um, you know, one question is what can a, what can we do? What can a viewer do as, as this podcast goes out and people uh, see this, what's, what's the right way to to get involved or how can we help you uh, spread the message to help Consumers, like, don't forget about us, guys. Yep. We pay the bills. How, how can we help here? 
Hey, listen, I really appreciate that. You know, go to consumerenergyalliance.org. Find me, uh, David Holt, on LinkedIn. Uh, and we can talk about, you know, individual campaigns, ways to support CEA, ways to get involved. There's there's volunteer opportunities. There's educational STEM related uh, energy opportunities. Um, there's we're running these campaigns all over the country. <clears throat> but ultimately, it's going to be, you know, up to us with you guys and and a whole bunch of others creating this army that you referenced earlier to kind of really start moving things back in that positive direction. So um, we we need help. We need voices. Uh, we need muscle. Um, but it's, um, you know, the good news is we've kind of gotten it started and there's there's others that are they're joining, joining on the team. So Anything we can do to spread the word, uh, go to consumerenergyalliance.org, uh, find me on LinkedIn. Uh, we can keep talking and, and find other creative ways to uh, find ways for people to get involved. Well, when you do come out with the report card on the states, I think that would be really interesting. We'd be happy to share that with our viewers and listeners. Um, I also think it's really interesting just um, everybody sort of lives in their own bubble and I don't think people across states are, I'm not sure people that live in state X realize people in state Y, you know, get to pay a lot less or, or vice versa. Like, I feel like an information exchange across, we need everybody to send in their power bill to yeah. whatever state you're living in. And then let's, let's talk about it and see if we can get a conversation going. Yeah. And that, that's very true. And we have, you know, some straw men that show, you know, a family of four that's paying X in different areas. I do feel, you know, I feel like California now realizes they're paying way too much. I think New England states are starting to realize they're paying too way too much. Um, and there's a little bit of frustration there. And and unfortunately, using those states as examples of ways not to pursue energy policy is is something we'll continue to 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 harp on. Um, but um, uh, we need states not to follow their lead for sure. Well, David, we sure appreciate it. Uh, keep up the good work. Keep us posted. And uh, and uh, we will publicize your links, including your LinkedIn. So get ready. You might All right. I'm ready. Todd, okay. Mike, Maynard, I really appreciate the time. Great to see you guys. Thank Thanks, you, David. sir. Thanks, All everybody. Right.